I think we're live now, Eloise. So over to you. Hi, everybody, and welcome to the session today on financing energy efficiency. Um, it's great to see so many, well, <laughs> great to have so many of you join us today. Um, we're pleased to see um, you here to learn about what is a growing area of interest in Malaysia, energy efficiency finance. Um, we hope that you leave this session um, having learned a lot about um, developing EE projects and um, how you can finance a project that is um, energy efficiency focused. We have a great line of speakers today from Carbon Trust, Amber Infrastructure and the Energy Commission and we thank everyone for joining us. Um, my job, my job is today is just to set the scene on energy efficiency. My name is Eloise Bennett and I am Southeast Asian Manager at Carbon Trust. I've been working in energy efficiency for um, around 10 years now, and I've been at Carbon Trust for nearly six years. Um, so with that, I will get started and I hope you um, enjoy the first presentation and the rest of the workshop. So, what I always find useful at the beginning of a presentation like this is to um, talk about the climate change projections and why we really need to talk about energy efficiency in Malaysia. Um, I find it's very helpful to remind ourselves of the model temperature of this century. And you can see here this graph, if emissions continue to be unchecked, then further warming of about between 2.6 and 4.0 Celsius will be expected by the end of the century. We need to limit global change to about two, way below 2C to stop um, catastrophic climate change. On this, on this diagram, you also can see the scenarios of where we currently are. So with current policies um, um, implemented across the world, we are reaching around a 3.4C 3, 3 temperature rise. Optimistically, that might drop to 2.9 Celsius, um, but it's still way above what we need to ensure that we are um, we're meeting climate change targets. So still a fair bit of work to do. This slide shows the global emission reduction potential in key sectors. So it basically shows what is possible. If we meet this emission reduction potential, we would also then close the emissions gap and, and be on track to meeting climate change targets. But this is gonna require rapid and far reaching um, um, transitions across all sectors of the global economy. They need to transform how energy is used, the source that it comes from, but there are lots of opportunities across all sectors. Climate scientists are continuously modeling and refining pathways for global emissions to drop to the levels which are aligned with our targets. Um, EE energy efficiency is part of all these scenarios. It must be, and that's not a typo. It really is trillions of dollars that can be saved across the global economy. EE sits as one of the three key pillars to develop delivering an affordable two, two Celsius scenario. So according to Idris Deep, deep decarbonisation pathways, if we are going to meet what we what we are aiming for, energy efficiency and conservation sits alongside low carbon electricity and fuel switching as one of the drivers for, for this goal. One of my favourite statistics, it comes from the International Energy Agency, which looks at, um, estimates our two Celsius scenario, energy efficiency has to account for 38% of this emission reduction, which sitting next to renewable energy at 32% shows you really about how important it is um, in, uh, in the full spectrum of decarbonisation. But importantly, why we're here today, to allow that to happen, there needs to be the puzzle piece that is currently missing or is growing is there needs to be a huge amount more finance channeled into energy efficiency investments to allow that to happen. And looking at uh, the global picture, if we look at international agreements around climate change, NDCs, national determined contributions, which are what each country is putting forward as their slice of the pie towards meeting, um, meeting our climate change targets, they all really mention energy efficiency, but they don't, don't really go into detail on what the implementation is. That bit is often lacking. Um, and then actually, if we look at 2018, 2019, and actually how much progress the world is making on energy efficiency, unfortunately, 2019 data saw the lowest efficiency improvements in the past decade. So actually, 
energy is energy efficiency is slowing and that's measured by how much is energy how much energy is needed to create one unit of improved gdp so in 2015 that was about that slowed from 3% down to 1.2% in 2018 so a drop uh, a drop there which is um, not very encouraging cop 26 is on the horizon um, and actually energy efficiency will Apologies. Energy efficiency will play a key part of that of that conference coming up next year. Um, so, um, the one of the key themes there is net zero, net zero commitments, and that's saying that there's going to be um, zero carbon as a target for both governments and businesses. And this target will only be possible if people are reducing their energy demand. So, moving. On to Malaysia, um, these graphs I always find quite useful to see. This is not a unique position for Malaysia. This is um, a very common trend across the um, across the world. But you can see here since 1990, there's only really one direction for the key metrics to measure energy consumption and emissions in Malaysia, and that's up, and that's up. But looking at a macroeconomic level, you can see here that GDP is mapped against primary and final energy consumption. So um, quite obviously or um, interestingly, depending on um, how you see it, the uh, GD dotted line um, tracked against, against these two metrics just shows as primary energy and um, final energy consumption increases, so does GDP. The key to cracking um, the energy efficiency um, picture is decoupling that, that trend so that a country can continue to grow, become more productive, um, but that does not always mean that we have to increase the energy consumption of a country. That is why they call energy efficiency the first fuel of economic development. So um, it should be seen as the first thing to do because it's a way to reduce demand and therefore it reduces the, the need for additional energy generation capacity. It reduces carbon emissions and it also reduces energy expenditure, which is obviously one of the key drivers um, for people to invest in energy efficiency. You can really save money by, um, by driving efficient um, use of energy. This is highly important around the world, but more important in Southeast Asia because this is where most of the energy growth is going to happen, energy demand growth is going to happen up to 2035. And that fact on right there, you can see 95% of the projected growth in global energy demand will happen in developing countries um, and regions such as Southeast Asia. So how do you get yourself into an energy saving mind frame? How do you actually do it? And um, I think there's a few first steps of, um, of approaching the energy conservation journey. For a building, it's about using better building fabrics and designing a building better so that you can reduce um, the heating and cooling requirements. For a product, it's redesigning it so that it requires less energy to both manufacture and run. We, can also, we also need to look at how technologies and processes are managed, controlled, maintained, and then also, um, of course, investing in better and, and more efficient equipment. So this leads nicely into a little bit of an introduction to the ASEAN, UK's government's ASEAN Low Carbon Energy Programme. This is something that Carbon Trust is running alongside um, um, our partners EY and IMC Worldwide. This is a UK government funded aid programme which is, looks at two pillars of support um, around green finance and energy efficiency. We're, look, we're providing policy support, awareness raising, running pilot projects, looking at standards um, and providing capacity, capacity building, working across six of the ASEAN countries. We've been running this since 2019 and the work that um, we're doing on, on this workshop comes under this program. Um, key themes have come through, um, through our work in this program so far, and it's about Southeast Asia wanting to drive a, a more investment into energy efficiency so that um, it can um, generate more um, economic benefit and revenue for um, governments and private sector. Our focus in Malaysia on energy efficiency um, is um, advancing the market for energy efficiency finance, um, which is hopefully what we are um, starting today at this workshop. And I hope that um, you you come away with a more understanding of what we mean and how we can grow this this market in Malaysia. 
We are also supporting the issuance of green bonds um, by providing second party opinions and um, development, developing frameworks um, for free as funded by the UK government. So if you are interested in that, then please do get in touch with the Carbon Trust. Um, we're also on the long side trying to improve energy management practices across Malaysia, working with um, the working with private sector and also the Energy Commission, trying to um, promote energy efficiency, target setting and performance across food and beverage sector. And then we are looking at thermal energy management um, and how um, policies and regulations and strategies can um, improve Malaysian management of thermal energy generation across, across industry. So that was just a very quick introduction to why we are so focused on energy efficiency and why we think it should become, it, it should be increasing a priority for Malaysia and the world. Um, and later, um, um, Zulfiki will um, talk to you about all the great work that um, that's happening in energy efficiency in Malaysia already. Um, but now I'm going to hand over to my colleague, um, David Tobin, our senior consultant in the business services division of Carbon Trust, um, and as well as Kalyani Basu, our senior Southeast Asia analyst in Carbon Trust Singapore, to talk through the key things about uh, EE finance. How do you generate the business model? Um, how do you look at the, how does this, this differ from a different project, from an other project in terms of risk? what is happening in Malaysia and also how um, international experience can um, be an influence into the developing this market further in Malaysia. As mentioned, we will then um, be handing over to two um, really exciting guest speakers. So um, we have Zulkifli Umar from the Energy Commission, who's gonna talk to you about EE activities in Malaysia. And then Oliver Holden from Amber Infrastructure is going to talk to you about a, a successful EE financing scheme in the UK. And then we'll move on to audience question and answers. Um, so you guys can um, ask us um, uh, anything you want about the work, the, the stuff that we have presented. So that's it from me. Um, and I will hand over to um, the, um, the next session. Welcome to the session on financing energy efficiency. Thank you for joining. My name is David Tobin, a senior consultant at the Carbon Trust, and I'll be joined and presented today by my colleague Kalyani Basu, a senior analyst from our team in Singapore. At the Carbon Trust, we've been operating in the energy efficiency space since 2001, working with a range of stakeholders, including financial institutions, private organisations, as well as public authorities at a local and national level. And we'll be taking this opportunity to share with you some of our experiences. The presentation will be followed by a live question and answer session, so please submit any questions you may have and we'll try to respond to as many as possible at the end. So let's take a look at the session's agenda. So I'll be starting with an introduction to energy efficiency as a business model, looking at some of the uh, benefits and advantages of energy efficiency, but also some of the, the inherent risks in the business model. Um, and then moving on to consider some ways you might look to address that perception of risk. Kalyani will then take you through an outline of energy efficiency finance in Malaysia. And then we'll both take you through how experience from other countries uh, might apply to the Malaysian context. So let's start with an introduction to energy efficiency as a business model. So firstly, let's look at a few of the reasons why energy efficiency makes such good business sense. So one of the common reasons for investing in energy efficiency is to benefit from those redu reductions in energy costs. And in, in my experience, savings of up to 20% or more are often achievable by, by investing in well-established cost-effective energy efficiency solutions that will continue to save businesses money year after year. Um, there's also the, the clear benefits to corporate image from energy efficiency, but energy efficiency often brings other efficiencies that can result in businesses operating more effectively generally to, to, to bring down those bottom line operating costs and deliver that competitive advantage. It's also important to acknowledge that an increasing number of climate environment related regulations, standards and legislation set by um, authorities, but also by, by customers 
um, they make it essential that businesses take energy savings seriously in order to consider operating in the modern business environment. So this slide provides an illustrative example of the cumulative effect of energy saving when set against ever increasing energy prices. And put in this context, it's clear that the, the sooner businesses invest in energy efficiency, the, the better. I mean, you have here the, the dark blue line along the top, um, which should be considered business as usual. So a uh, business hasn't invested in energy efficiency. They've continued to operate um, uh, as they were. Um, energy prices have continued to increase year on year, um, and the result is a, a significant increase in their uh, overall energy costs. The green line is the energy management scenario. So it shows a company that the same company that has invested in energy efficiency reduced its energy costs um, and then has seen similar growth in energy prices but the the cumulative impact of that um, and the cumulative benefit of that is apparent with those significant savings over uh, over that period that we've analyzed here so it really illustrates the benefits um, of investing in energy efficiency now But uh, what is, what do we consider energy efficiency to be? So here it's stated, energy efficiency aims to gain the maximum results or effects from each unit of energy use. So that's about achieving the same outcomes through less energy. Now, as discussed, the benefits of energy efficiency can be uh, or are multifaceted ranging from the well understood carbon and cost saving benefits through to less frequently acknowledged benefits such as improved productivity, employee well-being and asset value. That is to say that if I run an asset more efficiently, it will last longer and retain value for longer. Analysis from the International Energy Agency suggests that um, the other benefits associated with energy efficiency can be two and a half times the value of the energy saving. And although these can be harder to quantify, they should still play a part in the justification for investing. We'll discuss those in more detail uh, later on. But when we're considering energy efficiency um, at, a, at a project level, um, what do we mean? So the energy efficiency projects can take many forms, but they often fall into efforts to uh, reduce building energy use, uh, to condition uh, and create condition buildings and create an environment um, that is comfortable for humans um, or, or for products, or to reduce the energy used in the actual manufacture of a product. So efforts to achieve um, one of these goals um, generally involves the optimization of components and controls um, associated with the building services systems. So that could be air conditioning or lighting, um, or with the, the motive forces or thermal energy application um, in the, the process of manufacturing a product. So that might be uh, motors um, driving or transferring a product or applying heat or removing heat from a product in the manufacturing process. Um, projects uh, which are shown here, which aren't actually energy efficiency, but are often considered within the same uh, pool, um, are, are the renewable um, energy uh, generation projects. And these are targeted at reducing the reliance on grid supplied energy. And they can include things like, such as biomass, uh, heat pump systems, wind and solar PV are just a, a selection of some of the, the projects we consider here. But as a whole, this is what we're uh, uh, considering when we're talking about energy efficiency projects. And when considering an energy efficiency project, it's essential to understand uh, a borrower's motivation for wanting to invest in energy efficiency. So if the borrower has a, a genuine desire to reduce the energy consumption um, or the environmental impact, then that borrower is more likely to have a strong understanding of their existing consumption and the potential impacts that the project will have. 
if energy efficiency is, is more of a side effect of the project, i.e. You know, it's an end of life replacement of a, a chiller system, for example, then the borrower's, mo the borrower's motivation might just be to keep the process running. And the, in this instance, the details around the efficiency uh, benefits of the upgrade may be less, uh, may be re less reliable and less um, accurately quantified by the borrower. So um, it's important to understand this as a, as a lender um, and the communication and um, relationship with uh, the borrower is therefore essential to understand uh, their key motivations and to mitigate uh, the associated risks. So when we're um, looking at some of the, the common motivations for energy efficiency um, in, in in a private organization or, or a borrower, what, what, what are we talking about? What, what, what do they tend to be? Well, firstly, um, as outlined, there is there's an underlying business risk associated with energy. Costs are rising um, and dependence on fossil fuels carries considerable uncertainty around supply, price and reputation that could place business at a disadvantage uh, to, to more advanced competitors. So energy efficiency becomes a tool, therefore, for, for risk management, in effect. And also, as noted on pre, uh, the previous slide, businesses may also be investing in uh, restructuring or to improve productivity or reliability with energy savings, therefore, coming as a secondary outcome. Um, so again, in this instance, uh, you know, the energy efficiency benefits might not be as well considered. Um, so be, be cautious of this as a, as a motivating factor for energy efficiency. Similarly, um, replacing equipment um, nearing the end of its natural life may also bring uh, inherent efficiency with it, um, which again requires um, caution um, that the borrower is fully appreciating the entirety of the benefits that the reduced costs of ownership will bring um, from an energy energy perspective. Uh, the last factor we're considering here is uh, energy performance contracts, which are really a, a mechanism um, that permits uh, energy efficiency projects to be undertaken, uh, driven by that motivation to save energy. Such, uh, such details within these uh, energy performance contracts regarding energy savings are usually quite well understood and, and strong for proven energy efficiency measures. Um, but the energy uh, performance contract construct can often suffer from the need for creditworthiness of stakeholders, be that the ESCO or the borrower. Um, and in order to, to be successful, it must have a robust approach to the measurement uh, and verification of, of energy savings. So a clear understanding of um, uh, all the elements impacted by this energy efficiency project uh, and the savings that will be uh, achieved uh, from those changes. And when we're talking about energy saving verification, what are we looking to verify? Well, in very simple terms, uh, we're looking at the change in energy consumption of a site, a system or asset when comparing a baseline. So the assumed amount of energy that would have been consumed, assuming business as usual or that no energy efficiency project had been implement, implemented against observed consumption patterns post implementation of an energy efficiency project. The difference between these two scenarios is the energy saving, um, which will bring with it the inherent energy cost savings and, and that reduced exposure to energy price volatility. Now, we have already touched on some of the co-benefits associated with energy saving, but just to reiterate some of these benefits that can be equally or uh, even more influential in deciding to proceed with an energy efficiency project. Um, so energy efficiency projects um, clearly act to reduce those bottom line costs of an organization, which in turn increases uh, the organization's competitiveness. Um, energy efficiency projects can also lead uh, often to more uh, efficient production. Um, so making more, more from less. Um, and equally operating 
uh, operations and maintenance requirements can be less with newer and more efficient equipment, meaning staff time can be reallocated to optimise systems elsewhere. Energy efficiency improvements to the building or even the process can often lead to an improved work environment. This improves staff well-being and can lead to improved uh, output from the same staff. Um, and ultimately, uh, a reduction in waste output, particularly where there are removal costs um, associated with that waste, such as solid um, or volatile waste. Uh, that waste reduction as a result of the energy efficiency project brings with it further potential for cost reduction in the removal of that waste. So again, many different benefits that can be a, a result of an energy efficiency project. Now, quantification of these added benefits can be challenging, especially when the project is complex and involves mul multiple processes in an industrial environment. So, um, however, when the benefits are quantifiable with a degree of certainty and reasoned justification, these co-benefits can be considered in a loan appraisal and can be factored into cash flow projections when considering the risk profile um, of a project or a borrower. So this example from the IEA highlights some co-benefits uh, that could be considered with a degree of confidence. So a reduced amount of uh, certain chemicals in a process or um, the reduced need for certain inhibitors within this uh, process. Um, these can be quantified quite readily. Um, but it also highlights there some uh, co-benefits that could not be quantified with sufficient certainty. So reduced labour costs, um, less downtime, reduced negative environmental impacts. All of these things could not be quantified, so weren't factored in. But you can see here that the co-benefits actually outweigh the financial savings or financial energy savings from the project. So very important that they are also considered where quantifiable. When making an initial assessment of the business case and viability of an energy efficiency project, be sure to factor in all of the upfront costs associated. So these can include pre-project costs such as initial feasibility assessments through to detailed project and program design. The dismantling and removal of existing equipment should also be considered along with the capex for the project. Um, ongoing operational costs over and above the ordinary should also be considered going forward, along with the costs associated with accurate measurement and verification of the energy savings. Again, we've, we've already discussed the importance of, of that. Um, we've discussed the various benefits and savings that can be accounted for post project and used to determine those key financial indicators that we, that we often see. So simple payback, internal rate of return and net present value. Now, for a robust business case, what should we expect to see? Well, firstly, it should be clear, communicating its purpose and outcomes to the desired audience. So if that if, if, if that audience is designed to be very, very technical and engineering, then we'd expect quite a lot of detail of that nature. If it's from a financial, financially driven audience, again, clarity on the, the financial elements and that go into the project. Um, from a technical feasibility, costs and uh, savings and project program perspective, we need to make sure that uh, the business case is realistic and achievable. Um, we also need to make sure that the uh, necessary due diligence has been undertaken to ensure that the commercial aspects are robust. Um, and lastly, the risks associated with all those elements of the project are fully understood by all of the relevant stakeholders. And again, a list at the bottom there of some um, important non-financial benefits that may also play into uh, the business case and decisions. So, talking about uh, risk, um, let's move on to how we can go about um, addressing that risk perception. So one of the key concerns with energy efficiency projects is that 
estimated cash flow from reduced energy consumption and co-benefits um, are not generated. Um, so this can be due to a number of reasons, but can be avoided with effective planning. So some common reasons for lower than expected cash flows include um, a poor assessment of saving potential. So in order to mitigate this effectively, um, project documentation should consider a scenario based approach to ensure that variations in key cash flow factors such as energy costs um, and production amounts are fully accounted for. The use of poor equipment or poor project design can be avoided with um, the appropriate level of due diligence um, and perhaps external or independent verification to some recognized standards to ensure you have that full confidence um, in the, 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 the project um, design and the equipment that's forming the component parts of that design. And some projects have a significant impact on ongoing operations and maintenance regimes. So make sure that all associated costs um, are properly accounted for so that you fully understand um, how the ongoing running of the, the system will fully impact the operation of the site. Um, and lastly, good planning and strong monitoring um, and verification of the associated savings is, is essential for accurate reporting of savings and to provide early warnings if savings aren't being realised without those strong monitoring and verification um, processes in place. Falling short of savings or target savings uh, won't be apparent and will be missed and it may be too late um, to make rectifications to the project to bring those back on track. So good monitoring is essential. Now, sometimes loans are provided uh, based on the collateral of the asset uh, being installed. However, with energy efficiency projects, this can be a challenge as the fixed asset often only represents a percentage of the total loan value. So there may be other aspects um, as, such as you know, project design, uh, monitoring and verification equipment, et cetera, um, whereas the actual asset uh, value isn't that significant. Um, also, the, the resale value of that asset can be relatively low once installed. And it might not even be feasible to actually remove that asset once it's been installed and is working on site. So as a lender, considering the collateralization of technical assets, um, it's therefore essential to understand the, about the value of that removable part once it's installed, if you are to use that in, in your decision making process. Um, and if the assets are very specialized for a single purpose, such as an industrial process, it's important for the lender to understand whether the asset can feasibly be used on similar sites, um, so similar manufacturing sites, if um, uh, that's the type of uh, asset that's been installed, in order for it to be considered uh, as collateral. So that's a very important consideration if that's playing into your um, decision making process. So having looked at the potential benefits and risks, risks associated with energy efficiency, there are clearly some transaction costs that need to be weighed up by a financial, financial institution in determining whether energy efficiency financing is worthwhile. Um, some instances where it is uh, potentially worthwhile include uh, situations where energy costs are high relative to turnover in a, a borrowing organization. So energy intensive industries. Um, energy is a core element of the business um, and therefore often sees a greater focus and care from the company. It also means energy efficiency can result in significant improvements in cash flow, um, reducing the risk of default. Um, and another situation where uh, estimated cash, cash flows have a high degree of, uh, is where estimated cash flows have a high degree of certainty um, to the extent that the energy cost savings can be used um, as collateral for the project. 
So this is this is really based on um, the financial institution having a strong capacity to assess uh, the value and, and risks associated with the energy efficiency projects in order to have the confidence to, to commit to taking this approach. But these are two um, areas that are potentially worthwhile uh, considering. Now, while the overall um, investment risk can never be fully removed, um, it can be managed by considering some of the following options. So um, consider risk removal by setting clear eligibility criteria for credit lines, um, such as criteria for the borrower, the equipment you are willing to support with your financing and details regarding the um, what you require of the, the saving documentation. And this can ensure that lending is, is focused in areas you understand sufficiently and are comfortable with financing. Um, another approach to take is decreasing the likelihood of risk by undertaking some of the best practice measures we have outlined here. So, um, you know, robust, making sure you have a robust business case. You have your due diligence processes in place um, and you have a design um, of a, a strong and reliable um, monitoring and verification process so that your energy saving is accurately um, and regularly um, monitored so that you can be confident that the savings are being achieved and you will get that return on, on that investment. And, and where risk likelihood can't be sufficiently managed or removed, um, you may consider sharing the risk. Um, and this might be via, via insurances or, or guarantee funds to help make the project bankable. So hopefully this inf information has helped with your understanding of the cons key considerations when considering um, the business case for energy efficiency. So I'll now hand uh, over to my colleague Kalyani to discuss um, some energy efficiency financing in Malaysia. Thank you. Thanks, David. Uh, I will now provide a brief overview on the current state of energy efficiency finance in Malaysia. So it should be noted that all installations in Malaysia that consume more than 3 million kilowatt hours of electrical energy over six months are required to engage a registered electrical energy manager. And their main purpose is to help ensure that the installation is aligned to energy efficiency and conservation practices. And this is part of a broader regulation on the efficient management of electrical energy in Malaysia. So based on data collected under this regulation, energy efficiency improvements that are most commonly used by energy intensive facilities in Malaysia relate to lighting as well as air conditioner and chiller replacements. Other types of EE projects that are also common relate to inverters, compressor systems, pumps, motors, as well as general process improvements. The energy efficiency finance opportunity in Malaysia can be estimated based on the cost savings available from energy efficiency measures that can address any existing inefficiencies in energy consumption across the economy. Uh, so this particular chart focuses on the industry sector, where we see that the electricity cost savings potential in just the top five industrial sectors is more than 392 million US dollars. And this does not even account for the savings potential from thermal energy. So with this, the total cost savings from EE activities does in fact represent a very attractive financing opportunity. Uh, looking deeper into the chart here, we see that some of the greatest energy savings potential is evident in the food and beverage sector, pulp and paper, as well as non-metallic minerals. For machinery, it's an interesting case because you see that although the percentage energy savings potential is quite small. Um, if this is entirely realized, then the absolute amount of cost savings is quite large in comparison. 
In terms of payback period, we see that most EE projects in industry can pay back the investment within a period of two years. And this, again, is another factor that demonstrates a strong opportunity for financial institutions in Malaysia to lend to energy efficiency. So we see that Malaysia has made strong progress in terms of developing EE finance schemes, most of which are primarily driven by the government. Five such schemes are included here as examples. Uh, so firstly, we have the Energy Performance Contracting Fund from NDV, and this can be accessed by energy service companies for projects in the building sector. Uh, then the Green Tech Malaysia financing scheme um, is focused on green technology producers, users, as well as energy service companies. And here, participating financial institutions can therefore access not only energy efficiency projects, but also renewable energy and green technology projects. And when they provide financing, they are able to benefit from the scheme's partial credit guarantee that is in place. Uh, the Energy Audit Conditional Grant was run by CEDA and Green Tech Malaysia. And this was where grants were offered to industry and commercial buildings to fund the cost of their energy audits, but with the caveat that energy efficiency measures that were identified through these audits should ultimately be implemented. The Malaysia Electrical Supply Industries Trust is one that funds energy efficiency projects implemented by utilities. And finally, we have the Green Bonds and Sukuks, which although not focused exclusively on EE, um, energy efficiency is still a subset of projects considered green under this framework. Although we have yet to see green bonds dedicated entirely to raising finance for energy efficiency. So these initiatives have been successful in progressing the energy procurement contracting model, as well as opening up the market for green technology investments. However, we see that EE in industry is still an untapped opportunity, um, and this is also the case in many other countries. And so the op optimal savings level is yet to be realized. So we had undertaken a gap analysis on the state of energy efficiency finance in Malaysia by speaking with multiple market players and were able to identify the following trends on the supply side of EE finance. So one issue that we see is that EE projects are yet to be recognized as a proven business model, with banks expressing unfamiliarity with EE machinery and technology and expressing concern around whether the payback period will be met. The second issue is that EE savings models remain misunderstood uh, and banks express skepticism as to how uh, EE projects will achieve their target savings. Another issue is that the risk perception of EE remains high, with many banks expressing a lack of trust in terms of project viability. Banks are also very reliant on guarantees and they often say that they would not consider lending to EE without risk mitigating mechanisms in place. Another issue we observed is that retrofit financing for energy efficiency in buildings is overlooked. And this is especially the case for optimizing technologies, uh, where we see that projects are often unwilling or unable to disclose the specifications of select technology. We also see that banks find it difficult to identify EE projects within their existing portfolio. And they often say that this is because loan applications are not related directly to EE. And there is always another underlying need that requires financing which makes it difficult to pinpoint what exactly an EE project is. And finally, we've observed a general consensus across banks um, expressing that there is a lack of in-house expertise in their organizations 
when it comes to assessing EE projects, um, particularly in terms of the EE technologies, the cost savings associated, and the payback period. As part of this same gap analysis, we also examine demand side barriers to EE finance. And so here are some of the recurring barriers that we found uh, relate to one, a low cost of electricity, which discourages action on energy efficiency. Uh, this is because industry is heavily subsidized with electricity costs being one of the lowest in the region. Uh, which is why action on energy efficiency is not a main priority. Uh, secondly, we see a lack of supporting evidence on project viability, um, and this is because energy audits typically provide data on energy savings, but lack detail around cost savings and payback period, which are data points that banks tend to evaluate in lending decisions. Finally, we see that um, the high upfront costs that are often associated with energy efficient equipment uh, tend to discourage action on transitioning towards energy efficiency. And so we see that energy efficiency measures that are typically proposed for financing are quite modest in nature and relate to very standard energy savings measures. So given the barriers identified on the supply and demand side of EE finance, uh, we think that there are certain strategies to implement in Malaysia in order to accelerate EE finance. So the first one is just tackling the knowledge gap on energy efficiency across both financiers and industry. After all, without appropriate awareness raising and capacity building, on what the EE business model really looks like, uh, any introduction of financial instruments or mechanisms will have limited impact. Uh, the second area to address is with regard to the high risk perception. So any tools that can build confidence on financing energy efficiency is very necessary in Malaysia. Examples of tools could include um, something that allows financial institutions to benchmark energy savings opportunities offered by pipeline projects or even verify the viability of an EE business model offered by a project. Uh, thirdly, we see that equipping EE projects with the necessary resources, technical solutions and expertise is very important to build bankable projects that can attract financing. And this can be done by providing technical assistance um, to ensure that a project is not only technically capable, but is able to translate the technicalities of the project into a viable business case. Finally, in terms of encouraging private sources of finance, to be channeled into EE, uh, the role of risk mitigating mechanisms is highly important, um, but keeping in mind that any dependence of financial institutions on government funded mechanisms should be uh, decelerated so that there is an ultimate transition towards independent lending processes. All right, so we will now present some learnings from other countries on their experience with EE finance and how these may apply to Malaysia. I'll provide some examples from Thailand and Brazil and then hand over to David to talk about the UK's progress on EE finance. So back in 2003, the Thai government introduced the EE Revolving Fund. This fund served two main purposes, which were to increase the awareness and capacity of banks to assess EE projects, and secondly, to provide credit lines at discounted rates to banks to encourage their lending to energy efficiency projects. The program was initially effective at attracting interest from commercial banks, 
the concessional credit lines meant that returns on the investments in energy efficiency became more attractive, while the technical assistance for assessing projects helped to build capacity across banks and mitigate the initial high perception of risk. Uh, however, the program was ineffective in terms of stimulating a self-sufficient market that could work without the incentives of concessional finance and technical assistance. Uh, the interest of commercial banks to lend to energy efficiency projects was not actually sustained beyond the life of the program. Um, it appeared that the local banks had not gained the sufficient experience and therefore confidence in providing finance to EE projects, which may have been due to a lack of skills transfer achieved through the technical assistance. There are plenty of lessons from Thailand that are applicable for Malaysia. Uh, first, any capacity building on energy efficiency finance for banks should include support on understanding the technical aspects of EE technologies and measures just to ensure that the knowledge gap is appropriately addressed in the credit and risk teams of banks. In the case that banks are willing to develop the assessments of EE projects in-house, uh, they must do so within the existing processes and institutional frameworks available. Uh, this is because, as we know, EE is not core to a bank's business model, and so it is important that any project assessment that is being developed is in line with any existing priorities, just to ensure that there is no resistance in the departments when it comes to uh, conducting these project assessments. If this is not possible, then guidance from third-party technical intermediaries may be necessary. Another lesson is that banks must also be trained to champion EE opportunities as part of guiding clients towards best practice financing decisions. Uh, this was a key lesson from the revolving fund in that banks became effective in generating awareness among their customer bases on the energy efficiency opportunities uh, given the concessional credit terms available. In Brazil, a key EE financing mechanism that was piloted is the Energy Savings Insurance. This was a program that was also established in Colombia and Mexico with the same purpose of fostering EE financing by providing an insurance scheme that covers end users in the event that the estimated energy savings are not realized. Uh, in the scheme in Brazil, AXA, as well as four regional development banks were involved. Uh, some of the risk mitigating components of the ESI scheme included the use of standardized energy performance contracts as a way to reduce transaction costs uh, and enable banks and insurers to assess EE projects in a standardized manner. Uh, secondly, they used a list of eligible technical equipment as a way to verify whether an EE project is uh, eligible for this scheme. And lastly, they established a certification procedure for projects to ensure that all uh, monitoring and verification procedures necessary were in place. Um, all of these components contributed to reducing the risk perception as well as the actual risks um, of projects and enabled trust building across all the key stakeholders that included the borrower, the financial institution and the insurance company. The barriers that were addressed by the ESI closely mirror those in Malaysia, especially given the high risk perception from financial institutions. So some of the key learnings from the ESI is the importance of including multiple risk mitigation approaches. Uh, so anything from project verification and standardized performance contracts uh, will be key to reduce risk alongside the financial mechanism. 
and all of these factors contribute to enable the market to move towards a self-sustaining one once the life of the e-financing instrument is complete. Uh, but in order to further test the feasibility of such a mechanism in Malaysia, we would have to answer some of the questions listed here. So um, looking into whether there is an adequate pipeline or scale uh, in the EE market that would make it worthwhile for insurers. Also looking at whether insurers are willing to expand their business into a relatively unfamiliar market and whether customers are willing to sacrifice some of their projected energy savings in order to pay for the premium of the coverage. And finally, it's important to understand whether the banks recognize the value of insurance um, and whether it would reduce the cost of capital sufficiently uh, to drive a net increase in investment in EE. So I will now hand back to David to talk through some of the UK examples. Thank you, Kalyani. Now I'm going to take you through um, some of our experience of the energy efficiency lending market in the UK. Um, it's fair to say that while a lot more things have improved, um, we did and continue to some extent to face some of the, the, the challenges common to Malaysia. So for a start, newer technologies were, were less well understood, deemed high risk, high cost, which you know weakened the business case. Um, the energy performance contracts were, were a new concept um, with low trust levels and high transaction costs, both for the bank and, and the customer, making them unappealing. Um, SMEs were and you know, still are to some extent considered higher risk um, with that sort of insufficient collateral assets um, to secure loans. Um, and also energy efficiency wasn't the priority that it is now. So um, uh, for so many organizations, so, so why why would they invest in an energy audit, for example, to better understand the energy efficiency potential in the business when it's not a priority for them? I'd say that now has changed dramatically um, and business focus is much more on, on energy efficiency and carbon reduction. Um, so the perception of some of these other elements of new technologies and energy performance contracts has changed along with it. And to overcome this, um, a few approaches were taken in the UK, including um, a policy, regulation, um, awareness raising and targeted finance schemes. And some of these have included uh, financial institutions um, have often looked uh, often looking to bolster typical direct uh, lending assessment activity by using internal or external teams of technical assessors to ensure projects are viable and worthy of investment. Um, I have worked with a financial institution in, in the past um, in that role um, and it provides them with that confidence to fully appreciate um, and understand the, the, the benefits of the efficiency type of investment um, to enable them to commit to that with confidence. Um, there's also indirect financing um, via banks that has been achieved by incorporating energy efficiency finance as a bolt-on service so for existing customers where existing financial arrangements are in place. The relationship is already strong. The trust levels are already high. You have confidence in their um, financial security and you can commit to making that investment based on your understanding of that customer um, and the likelihood uh, they have undertaken the required due diligence to ensure a thorough uh, and confident energy efficiency project. Um, technology providers um, have also got involved um, with, you know, they come with strong uh, project knowledge and product knowledge and confidence in the savings um, that can be achieved from their products. So this is a good way to engage um, hard to reach areas of the market, such as uh, SMEs. 
Now, one example um, sharing here is, is Siemens, who I'm sure you're, you're familiar with. Um, so they have a, they've been financing, financing energy efficiency since 2011. Um, they were initially set up uh, with the Carbon Trust as technical assessors and experts um, to deliver financing to both the private and public sector with a view of making commercial returns on this investment. Um, the scheme primarily provides leases, so this is I guess, an alternative to a cash or bank facility where Siemens buy the asset, retain ownership, um, the user has sole use of the asset by renting it for an agreed period and returns it at the end of the term. So that means that the upfront cost and, and cash flow is kept within, within the user's uh, business. Um, but they also provide sort of higher purchase type agreements um, or outcome based project financing. Um, all primarily um, building on those uh, existing customer relationships, so customers that may already have some of their products on site, um, enabling the customers to benefit from that energy efficiency while the business model is set up for Siemens to make that return. Uh, another example given here is the Royal Bank of Scotland uh, set up a dedicated fund for energy efficiency financing for energy efficiency retrofits and renewable energy generation. Um, they went through a process of here of training some of their key account managers. So these are non-energy efficiency experts, um, but it enabled the sort of account managers um, rather than just the day-to-day -day, um, financial aspects to effectively engage with customers and provide financing terms on a case-by-case -case basis related to energy efficiency. Um, it's really helped improve the understanding of their employees and make uh, this uh, this scheme of success. So finally, and in summary of some of the content covered today, what are the what are those core barriers and what strategies can you you take to to overcome them? So, firstly, by by targeting those existing client relationships and, and, and clients that are known to be financially resilient, um, high energy dependency and a good potential for energy savings within the organisation. This can enable financial institutions to lend with a high degree of confidence um, and reduce the risks associated with this uh, developing energy efficiency market. Um, another area to consider uh, is to to look to try and minimise that transaction time and the associated costs that come along with that additional time um, when considering energy efficiency financing. Um, so consider setting clear criteria uh, and technology lists to help it identify energy efficiency projects that have that high degree of confidence in savings and that you're uncomfortable, you're comfortable engaging with. Um, and also consider where you can add energy efficiency finance as a bolt-on service to existing uh, financial uh, products that you have with your customers. So that agreement, agreement structures are already in place and it's, it, it's, it's easier for customers and the bank to adopt um, energy efficiency financing. You might look to choose borrowers that undertake activities with high energy intensity. So this might, might be food and drink, companies, iron and steel, paper and pulp, these are all energy intensive sectors. Um, they're more likely to, to value energy efficiency investment because energy is such a, a core part of their business. And lastly, look to engage the supply chain, uh, you know, technology providers, equipment providers, um, to provide leads, provide contacts, and help explain to customers the, the, the benefits of energy efficiency to overcome that element of lower market awareness um, to help you engage. So this brings us to the end of our presentation on energy efficiency financing. Thank you for listening. I hope you found uh, some of the content useful and will now be available to answer questions. Thank you. Hello everyone. Good afternoon. Um, Zul from Energy Commission Malaysia here.
Can you guys see the slides? I hope you can. Uh, not yet. Where did it go? Okay, can you see the slides now? Yep, all good. Okay. Right, good afternoon, everyone. Um, can call me Zoe, please. I'm from the Energy Efficiency Conservation Unit of Energy Commission Malaysia. I would like to do some sharing with you guys on the energy efficiency initiatives in Malaysia. Um, well, uh, we'll start with um, Malaysia's national energy policy since 1974, um, where in the beginning it was vested on Petronas of the extensive rights to explore, develop petrol resources, resources in Malaysia. But in 1979, we have included in our policy uh, to ensure adequate security and cost effectiveness of energy supply and to promote efficient utilization of energy. Um, and as we go on in 2001, we have uh, implemented our five fuel diversification strategy to include renewable energy as one of the energy supply in Malaysia. I just want to share a bit on the final energy consumption by sectors in Malaysia from 1990 to 2018. As you can see, for the past 20 years, transportation has surpassed industry in being the most sector to consume energy, uh, whereas industry has become the second one, and the third is, of course, residential and commercial. So, yeah, we do have a big increase in transportation uh, energy consuming, uh, and we are looking into it at the moment. Uh, a bit on the energy supply and demand in Malaysia. I would like to focus on the demand side. As you can see, um, we have about 25,000. This is a 2014 statistics, actually. But as of now, we have about 25,000 number of industries in Malaysia, which are consuming about 38% of our electricity generated. Uh, the second is commercial sector, about 1.5 million of them. Um, customers are the TMB, which consume about 31.35% of our electricity generated. And of course, the last one is, is domestic sector with uh, a, a number of about 7 million consumers registered with Naga National Barhat and consuming about 20% of our electricity generation. So looking at this, we know that we have a big uh, things in front of us to do in terms of energy efficiency in Malaysia. Uh, a bit on our legal framework on energy efficiency in Malaysia, regulated by Energy Commission. In our Energy Commission Act 2001, it did, does say in there that we are we are to promote efficiency, economy, and safety in the generation, production, transmission, distribution, supply, and use of electricity, and also need to promote the use of renewable energy and the conservation of non-renewable energy. Uh, we also have in our Electricity Supply Act 1990, which says that um, the efficient use of electricity is determined under Section 23, A, B, and C, where it gives birth to what we now known as um, Efficient Management of Electric Energy Regulation 2008, which mentions that any consume any installation that consume electricity above 3 million kilowatt hour for a period of six months consecutive, we need to will we'll need to uh, have in place a registered electrical energy manager registered by Energy Commission. Uh, the other amendment to the regulation in 2013 give us the empowerment to implement and enforce the minimum energy performance standards for domestic appliances. In 2013, we have regulated five domestic electrical appliances, which are air conditioner, refrigerator, television, domestic fan, and lighting. Okay. Okay, the next one is the overview of the energy efficiency initiative in Malaysia. Uh, since 1996, to be honest, well, we, we have implemented quite a few of EE initiatives in Malaysia, uh, starting with the biggest one that we had in 1991 is, 1999 is called Malaysian Industrial Efficiency Improvement Program, MIEIP. And then um, this is where we started to, um, we have introduced the concept of um, EPC and ESCO, an energy service company in Malaysia. Uh, into, and after that, it's, it's kind of, um, 
slows down a bit uh, until 2001, sorry, uh, 1919, sorry, until 2001, where the first Malaysian standards uh, known as MS1525, which is a code of practice for EE and RE in non-domestic buildings were first introduced, and also the first fiscal incentives for EE. Um, in 2000, sorry, in 2002, uh, there was an pro, a, a, a program uh, to, energy, to, do, to conduct energy audit in government buildings. Um, and then there was an EE and RE in education curriculum and university courses introduced in 2002. But uh, in two, and, and, and in 2008, we have, um, uh, we have uh, enforced a regulation known efficient management of electrical energy, efficient management of electrical energy in 2008, which um, regulates installations that uses electricity more than 3 million kilo hour for a period of six months consecutive, where they need to appoint a registered electrical energy manager. In 2009, we have the first building ratings in Malaysia, which is uh, introduced by Malaysian Building Corporation, which is known as Green Building Index. And then in 2010, we have we introduced the Green Tech Financing Scheme, as mentioned before, and also the Building Sector Energy Efficiency Program Project 2010-2016. And we did a pilot project to retrofit selected government buildings. In 2011, we have a peer review program under APEC. And then we started our SAFE program in 2011-2013, basically to promote the minimum energy performance standards requirement for domestic uh, electrical or dom domestic electrical appliances. In 2012, we have another program uh, with UNIDO, which is known as Industrial EE for the manufacturing sector, or short for IEE MMS. This program basically a program to introduce uh, MMS uh, ISO 50001 to be adopted by selected uh, manufacturing uh, installation in Malaysia. In 2013, we have um, made it mandatory for MAPS to be implemented in Malaysia for five domestic appliances, and it was quite successful. And in the same year, we introduced energy performance contracting into the government sector after we have received approval from the government. And then in 2014, we conducted an energy audit in selected ministries. Uh, this is, of course, financed by the government. And then uh, at the same time, uh, we also monitor the energy consumption by certain ministries in the Gulf, certain ministries based upon the instruction by the Chief Secretary General at that time. Uh, and then in 2016, we finally uh, implemented the National Energy Efficiency Action Plan, which targeted um, a reduction of about 52,000 gigawatt hour electricity on the demand side in 2025, which is about 8%. And then at the same year, we have um, implemented the EE projects under the 11 Malaysia plan known as the Energy Audit Conditional Grant, where in this program, we provided grant um, to certain is, uh, installation to conduct energy audit. And um, from there, they need to do some retrofitting in, uh, in the same amount as what we have financed or more and produce uh, the, uh, the audit report to us. Uh, in 2017, we created the EPC fund uh, with MDV Malaysia Debt Venture. The purpose of it is to finance EE project under the 11, 11 Malaysia plan. Those who wish to get uh, some financing uh, in order to conduct their EE project can, can, can source it from the EPC fund. Uh, at the same time, at the same year, EPU Energy, Energy Unit under Prime Minister Department has uh, conducted a DSM we study uh, under three sectors, uh, which is electricity, thermal, and transport. And uh, the outcome of this study is the drafting of our uh, bill, Energy ABC Conservation Act. Uh, it's a bill that is planned to be tabled to the, to the parliament by quarter three next year. And then under, and also in 2018, we have um, uh, started our BEI labor program in government buildings where uh, ministries or government buildings are, are to be labeled with um, uh, building energy intensity label to show the, the level of intensity, energy intensity that they are consuming. Thank you. Right. Um, by uh, in doing all that, we must never forget uh, the basic approach that we 
use in order to come up with EE initiatives in Malaysia, where uh, it can be uh, a regulatory or policy or any measures. The first one that we need to remember is that it's always looking back into economic measures. Um, it's 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 um, it's knowing what the people used to buy or people will be buying or what is the means that uh, the most people will, will be doing. So it always turn back to economic measures. Second is persuasive measures. Um, we need to persuade. Um, we need to persuade um, the interest or create a buy-in uh, or create awareness by the people um, in doing EE. Well, as, as mentioned, EE is quite, it's, it's a tough sell actually. Um, I, I agree with Damien earlier where he mentions that in the beginning, it's not easy to implement energy efficiency. Same in Malaysia currently, I can say that EE is a tough sell and we need to create a lot of persuasion for people to adopt energy efficiency. So, uh, the third one is prescriptive measures. After you have uh, conducted your persuasion, you have looked into the economic part of it, you have to come up with the written measures. Prescriptive is, is um, in, in terms of, for example, coming up with standards or guidelines or uh, uh, regulation that people can follow. Last but not least, which in Malaysia is still a bit slow, is the R&D uh, and demonstration. Uh, we, we need a lot more of R&D conducted by um, public uh, private institution in order to demonstrate that EE is, is, um, is viable and can be, can be implemented in Malaysia. Uh, the last thing that, uh, the last one, the, the last but not least is I wish to share about the BEI, uh, National Building Energy Label of BEI ratings in Malaysia that we have been conducting in government buildings at the moment. Um, it's, it's, um, it's a program where we wanted to showcase that uh, the, the sort of energy intensity uh, in government buildings in Malaysia. So far, we have uh, labeled about 250 government buildings since last year. And as you can see on your left is the star rating and the BI range value in the units of kilowatt hour per meter square per year. Uh, we are targeted that uh, by 2023 onwards, we will be able to label about 5,000 government buildings. But since we are in the COVID pandemic stage at the moment, um, I think we have to extend that a bit to maybe 2025 or 2027. Uh, we are plan we plan to uh, label basically all purpose-built office and government buildings, hospitals, universities, polytechnics, and schools. The benefits of BI labeling is that since 40% of energy produced and 70% of electricity generated are being consumed by buildings, it is uh, the best move forward in order to implement EE in Malaysia. We, will wish all, we, we also wish to accelerate the efforts in making government buildings efficient and smart. Um, we also wanted to provide and disseminate information to building occupants on the energy usage performance of the building. Uh, we also wanted to create a platform where there'll be a peer-to-peer -peer review buildings, uh, review of government buildings performance. And it is also uh, in line with the uh, pledge made by the government in, to reduce 45% uh, of our GHG emission by 2030. Um, we are not competing with uh, the existing rating tools in Malaysia, example, GBI or Green RE. But basically what we are doing is the first move for the buildings to be rated uh, or to improve their energy consumption. They have a choice either to do it themselves through APC or, or so on and so forth, or they can use the assistance of uh, the existing rating tools in Malaysia, such as GBI, Green RE, Micres, or BCA, Green Mark, and Leeds. The way forward for EP Energy FC in Malaysia, based on what we have been doing for the past 10 years, is basically to, cre to create a funding mechanism. We, we realize that um, without a funding mechanism, majority of the energy service company that we have been registering since 2013 will not be able to provide um, a total solution uh, in terms of improving energy efficiency at a certain installation, because most of them are a small medium uh, company. They need resource. They need funding resources in order to implement EE project. 
we also constantly trying to improve the resources uh, the resources that we have uh, in ee and creating expert energy auditor and uh, also expert monitoring and verification personnel we do conduct our enforcement on ee on uh, installation that was supposed to appoint energy manager uh, but now we on, we we do it in in, in a way we uh, conduct and um, call compliance audit. Uh, yes, we need to improve our policy and legal framework. That's why at the moment we are currently drafting our Energy Efficiency and Conservation Act, which to in, which is to include electrical and thermal energy. We constantly conduct awareness program with our stakeholders. It can be from the uh, manufacturing sector or tip normal user sector. Um, in line with IR 4.0, we do encourage uh, smart building monitoring um, using uh, whatever system that is available to them. Um, Malaysia is, uh, uh, sorry, the government is also in the process of um, installing smart meter uh, in order to create a smart grid scenario in Malaysia. Well, I think that's the last slide for me. And um, thank you for listening and have a good day. Thank you. Good afternoon, everyone. Um, thank you very much to the uh, the Carbon Trust today for inviting me to come and speak. Um, I'm just going to provide a bit of an overview of um, some of the schemes that um, we run and manage at our infrastructure. First of all, um, I just give you a bit of background. Amber. Um, um, uh, we manage six um, funds uh, and two managed accounts. Our, our flagship fund um, is uh, International Public Partnerships. It's a FTSE 250 listed fund. Uh, invests in a range of public infrastructure assets. Um, this includes things like schools, hospitals, prisons. Um, also, we have some investments in um, the offshore transmission lines, which connect uh, wind farms into the electricity grid in the UK, uh, as well as Thames, uh, the Thames Superstep. Um, and some transportation assets um, in UK, Europe, and North America, and Australia, including Gold Coast Light Rail. Um, so we're an international fund manager with um, interests across um, the UK, Europe, North America, and Australia. We also run um, a digital infrastructure fund uh, on behalf of uh, HM Treasury in the UK. Um, that's got a 400 million pounds in it so far. I'll go through the um, London Energy Fund and the, the Mayor of London's Energy Fund and Spruce uh, in, in later slides. Um, we've got an exciting new um, initiative that we launched uh, last year uh, called the Three Seas Fund. That's a greenfield fund uh, focused on the transport, digital and energy sector, um, <clears throat> mainly, mainly focused in Central and Eastern Europe, um, has some commitments from... Um, <clears throat> the European Investment Bank, uh, that's 520 million in this fund. Um, this slide gives you a flavour of kind of the history of Amber. So we were uh, originally um, part of Bad Brook and Brown uh, in 2009 uh, in a management buyout. Um, and over the, the 11 years since we've been in operation, um, yeah, we've got six funds under management, there's 150 of us and nine offices. So that includes offices in the UK, um, US um, and a couple of offices in Australia and we recently um, with the Three Seas Fund expanded our offering in Europe so including offices in uh, Munich, Prague and Warsaw. Um, so the first slide on the Mayor of London's Energy Efficiency Fund. Um, Um, so MIF is a, a European Regional Development Fund uh, established by the Greater London Authority uh, and designed to catalyze investment in the low carbon sector. 
Um, Amber undertook a competitive procurement process to be awarded the contract to act as fund manager for me in uh, 2018. The fund seeks to address uh, market failure uh, in London's low carbon sector by providing flexible and competitive finance to accelerate, enable and enhance eligible projects. Um, MEF offers finance up to 18 years in length. Um, typically, we will undercut the um, rate of finance from the public sector or other private sector sources. We can also um, allow for spoke port drawdowns. So we can allow um, a borrower to draw down the money as and when they need it. Um, our, our role is to fill the funding gap that's left by the kind of traditional uh, type of investors in this space. Um, we allow kind of new technologies for longer payback periods um, to get the go ahead. Um, we kind of see ourselves um, uh, to sit between uh, grant finance uh, and commercial finance. Um, MEF is also designed to uh, crowd in um, other funding sources. Uh, so we leave kind of a long-term legacy uh, and move the market towards full commercialization. Um, we provide senior debt, mezzanine finance and equity. Um, the focus of the fund is on energy efficiency, uh, decentralized energy, EV charging infrastructure, so sorry, electric vehicles, and also renewables. In terms of sectors, we go for um, uh, public sector entities uh, and SMEs. So that can include, in terms of the public sector, that can include uh, local authorities or municipalities, uh, registered providers, housing associations, uh, health, so in the UK, that would typically the NHS, um, and also we work with the um, charity sector, um, in terms of our investment period, so we've been mandated to run the fund until May 2023. Uh, it's on a first come, first serve basis. Um, the fund has uh, commitments from the European Regional Development Fund. And that includes um, £43 million of ELDF. And um, we've recently been awarded an additional £8 million, so now we've got £50 million in the fund. Um, <clears throat> the fund, you might see that there's some European Union flags on these slides. Um, it is using European money, uh, but the fund has been um, underwritten by the UK Treasury. So whatever happens come next year when we finally uh, exit the EU, uh, the fund will continue. Um, to give you a bit of flavour of the investment criteria, um, so me has a distinct criteria to look at every project to make sure it delivers upon carbon and energy savings. So for every £7,000 of uh, the GLA funds invested, the project must save a tonne of carbon dioxide per annum, and energy efficiency projects need to achieve a 20% energy saving. Um, we have some technical experts in-house that will usually kind of work with uh, the project to ensure that they uh, will meet this criteria. Um, another criteria that we have, because it's been set up by the Greater London Authority, it needs to be within Greater London. Um, so that's quite a large area, which essentially is, is maps kind of around the M25 in the UK. It's a 607 square mile area. Um, in terms of investment size, uh, it's targeting investments from half a million upwards. Um, we, to kind of verify the energy savings and ensure that we do appropriate diligence, um, we uh, need to include some digital costs in our loan agreements. So that's why we kind of think uh, typically half a million plus is where they kind of where we become competitive. Um, projects also must start before um, May 2020, must start before 31st of May 2023, but they do not need to be completed. Um, so to give you an idea of what we can fund, um, so we can do energy efficiency, including um, LED lighting schemes, building fabric upgrades, building management systems, and the whole building retrofits. Um, we can also do kind of de decentralized energy solutions. That includes district heating, heat pumps. Um, we also look at renewables, so that could include anything from 
uh, small scale solar uh, to biomass. Um, we typically don't seem to get many wind farms because we're focused within a small area of London. Um, over the last year, we've kind of extended our remit to include electric vehicle charging infrastructure, um, which is quite an exciting development for the fund. Um, we're also seeing that we're increasingly looking to combine kind of the electric vehicle charging infrastructure with other energy efficiency measures, so for instance, um, street lighting. Um, we can also kind of do the, the wider regeneration of projects, so perhaps a local authority might come to us uh, and they might want to redevelop their estate um, and we can, as, as they're doing a kind of wider regeneration, we can fund the uh, low carbon and energy efficiency elements of that. We can also do um, uh, perhaps technologies that don't fall within this list if they can demonstrate the um, energy and carbon savings. So in terms of the MEF funding structure, um, MEF has crowded in leading commercial UK lenders, including the likes of Lloyds, NatWest, Santander, uh, Royal Bank of Scotland, SMBC and Triodos, Triodos to sit alongside the 50 million GLA PRDF. Um, Amber also invests in each project to demonstrate that Amber puts its own skin in the game. Um, MEF then blends this finance together and, let, and lends almost to the beneficiary in accordance with state aid. Um, it is also possible also for MEF to match the, um, the GLA funding here and the AMBA funding um, <clears throat> with funding at the project level. So for instance, we might go to a local authority and they might want to put their own money in instead of using one of these commercial banks to provide a more competitive return. Um, we also do have a small amount of equity that we can put into projects um, that will need to be matched in terms of power pursuit with a third party investor. So in terms of the MEF application process, um, in the first stage, we ask applicants to basically tell us about the project. I'm going to say whether you think it falls within the MEF eligibility criteria. Um, so that's the criteria that I just listed out in terms of energy and carbon savings. So the key component really is that £7,000 investment uh, of tonne of carbon. The second stage um, is based on the project passing the screening process. They will then need to formally apply for me finance, setting out the finance structure for this project. The MEF team will work to finalise the structure and funding requirements in the industry in the investment teams terms. Um, MEF will engage the commercial lenders to see who can provide the most competitive terms. Uh, if they decline, then we can look to provide funding at the project level. Um, once our internal governance arrangements have been dealt with, we will undertake further diligence and fair legal documentation. Um, this takes us to the third stage, which is the decision to invest. Once the legal and technical due diligence has provided insurance on the project's ability to deliver savings and repay the fund's investment, the, uh, the MEF team will seek a final approval to invest from our investment committee. Uh, assuming this is forthcoming shortly after the project will receive MEF finance. And in the final stage, so the post-investment stage, most of the hard work has been done. This is standard reporting the project progress um, as expected during uh, construction operation periods and over the time the MEF finance will be repaid. We go out one year post completion um, with uh, one of our technical consultants to verify that the project has delivered on its energy and carbon savings. And we also just check that the equipment is uh, specified and they haven't gone out and bought a Ferrari. Um, and then let's to give you a bit of a flavour of what we've done so far. So uh, me has invested in seven projects to date. Um, the first project, first two loans that we did was to Epsom and St. Helio uh, Hospital, uh, an NHS trust. Um, we signed an energy performance contract with Breathe, um, and that's delivering um, Total carbon savings about three and a half thousand tons per year, saving the trust about one million. Uh, the measures include things like 
uh, a combined heat and power system, uh, building management system, and ventilation upgrades. Um, with the London Borough of Richmond, we financed a street lighting upgrade to upgrade about 11,000 street lights with LEDs. Uh, that's delivered a 63% energy saving and uh, it's reducing the carbon uh, dioxide by 1,185 tonnes per year. And this is crucial for helping the uh, borough meet its uh, climate emergency uh, commitment. Um, with the London Borough of Southwark, um, we financed uh, a retrofit of an existing uh, heat network with water source heat pumps. Um, that's quite like an interesting novel scheme, uh, tapping into the London aquifer, uh, delivering kind of uh, savings of over 1,700 tonnes per year uh, and reducing energy consumption by about 30%. Um, and then the last deal was, uh, so last year we expanded our remit to uh, fund uh, electric vehicle charging infrastructure. So this is a very innovative deal uh, with the SMEs and Navy Energy uh, to uh, finance the charging infrastructure on a bus depot that's operated by a major UK bus operator, Abellio, uh, to operate two key London bus routes. Um, so we funded the actual charging infrastructure alongside uh, a battery and um, uh, private lenders uh, finance the, the vehicles themselves and the batteries on the bus. I'll just quickly take you through a couple of our predecessor funds. So, um, the London Energy Efficiency Fund is the predecessor to me that was set up in originally in 2011, uh, again by the Greater London Authority. Uh, had commitments from the European Media Development Fund and the European Investment Bank. Um, over the life of the fund, it committed about 90 million capital and reduced the carbon emissions by about 40,000 tonnes. Um, and it made us about 420 million pounds of external capital. It was slightly less wide in remit and mainly focused on kind of district heating and uh, energy efficiency schemes. In terms of what LEAP has financed, um, so it financed the uh, retrofit and extension of um, one of London's best known tourist attractions, the Tate Modern. Um, measures included a um, uh, waste heat recovery system, uh, along with kind of lighting and building fabric upgrades. Um, with the London Borough of Croydon, we funded a borough wide retrofit uh, across 50 sites, um, including kind of schools, libraries. Uh, and civic buildings. Uh, this included things like fabric upgrades, LED lighting, um, heating upgrades for the, for the buildings. Um, with the London Borough of Enfield, we've actually done two loans with them. Uh, so first originally uh, with uh, the London Energy Fund and later with uh, me uh, and to finance uh, a large-scale heat network that is fed by um, an energy from waste facility up in North London. Um, that's due to be, the heat network is uh, being built out at the moment and the uh, energy from waste facility is due to connect into that from 2026 onwards. That's a really large scale, one of the lar London's largest scale regeneration projects that's going on at the moment. So it's, it's extremely exciting. Um, and back in 2018, um, one of uh, LEAF's last deals was to finance the uh, retrofit of Roehampton's Department of Media, Culture and Language Buildings to include uh, lighting and building management system upgrades. Um, and that's delivering a 300 tonne, uh, sorry, delivering a saving of 300 tonnes uh, to the university per year, which again is helping them meet their uh, climate um, change obligations. And then the last fund that I want to take you through today, um, it's called, it's quite a long name, it's the Scottish Partnerships for Regeneration in Urban Centres. Um, so this is a fund that's managed by my uh, colleagues up in the Edinburgh office. Um, it's a uh, predominantly uh, a regeneration fund focused on um, repurposing 
Commercial and Public Sector Buildings it's on behalf of the Scottish Executive, the European Investment Bank and the private sector. Um, so to date, it's uh, backed about 16 projects, committed over £130 million pounds of capital, and um, uh, has delivered over 20, 29,000 metres squared of green, excellent business space. space. Um, and there's further 16,000 square metres under construction. It's the Ward Rilling Fund that recently uh, got the Property Investment Team of the Year at the Scottish Property Awards. Um, and then in terms of uh, some of the case studies that uh, this Bruce Fund has, has funded, uh, so that includes St Andrews University, uh, so this includes a £25 million pound, uh, by mass um, energy centre and heat distribution network at the university. Um, that's delivering carbon savings of over £8,000 per year. Um, what's quite interesting there is they've used uh, a local feedstock um, in the university, I think within 30 miles. Uh, I think previously there was a kind of a, a, a gas district heating system there. Um, similarly with uh, Cubes, that's a housing association up in uh, Glasgow. Done a similar retrofit of the heat network with a biomass system uh, serving about 700 properties. Um, we've also done, so 55 Douglas Street, this is kind of an example of one of the uh, office refurbishments that we've done. This typically um, includes us kind of taking an old, poorly performing building, uh, stripping it out, refurbishing it so that it meets the kind of Briam excellent standards. Again, the last one we have here, Livingston Trade Park. Um, as an example of a warehouse type refurbishment that we've done with the Spruce Fund. Um, <clears throat> quite interestingly, along with the green initiatives, we've also included um, <clears throat> things like EV charging and cycle parking to improve the wider kind of sustainability elements of the scheme. Thank you very much. Many thanks, Oli. Uh... We will now have a short Q&A session, so just feel free to uh, insert any of your questions in the chat box. One that has just come up from the audience that I'll direct to everyone online um, is, what is the most important information for project owners to provide to banks uh, in order to get financing for energy efficiency? I'm happy to pick that up, Ariane, if you like. Um, I think when you're looking to build a um, strong business case for a financial institution, I think it's one of, one of the most important things I find is transparency. So it's a real transparency in your uh, motivation for undertaking the project. You know, really outline that you know, as an organisation you're looking to you know, reduce your CO2 emissions, um, improve your reputation, help grow the business. That really helps um, sell the business case to, to potential lenders. Um, transparency around your costings, so how have you established uh, you know, what the, the project is going to cost in its totality? Um, transparency around your, your savings calculations, so how have you uh, really spell out to a lender how you know that investment is going to return based on you know the core energy savings but also those other non-financial benefits non-energy benefits rather um, that, that bring that uh, additional financial benefit um, be clear and transparent around the, the overall project life cycle costs as well so what you know, what, what is this project going to cost to maintain over its life and uh, end of life uh, to enable you to get accurate sort of net present value and turn rate return information. Um, we mentioned there, be very open about the risks and explain why you know, these returns might uh, not come about, but also what mitigating actions you're taking to make sure that they do actually um, uh, come through. And also consider case studies. So um, similar similar projects um, and similar organisations that you might be aware of that have um, 
where investments have returned, um, demonstrating the benefit of that energy efficiency project. So I think if you go through the process of explaining that in a very transparent and open way, it increases the, the chances of getting finance. I would say. Thank you, David. Um, does anyone else have any last comments to share before we wrap up? Um, I think it's quite interesting to think about also the kind of ownership and whether you have the right relevant permissions to undertake the kind of uh, the refurbishment or the energy efficiency measures. Um, so increasingly what we're seeing is we'll be speaking to, um, for example, like a, a sports facility that will be occupying a, a local authority building. Um, they'll be very much interested in trying to um, improve the wider sustainability and the low carbon measures within the building. Um, but they don't necessarily, if they're not necessarily the bill payer, that's quite difficult for them. Sorry, if they're not necessarily the owner of the building, but they're the bill payer, um, there's this kind of disconnect between um, the local authority who's not really necessarily always prepared to invest in the building because they don't necessarily see any direct benefit themselves uh, and those that are in the building. There's also um, increasingly what we're seeing is um, there's different parts of the organization. So often we'll engage with um, those in the sustainability or energy management teams. They'll be very keen to do, uh, to, to borrow from me for, or LEAF. Um, and we kind of get quite a long way down the road and then find out that actually uh, the finance team doesn't want to necessarily borrow or doesn't have the facilities to borrow. So that's I think, an important uh, thing to consider to just make sure that you've kind of engaged uh, all the right participants. Okay, thank you. I think that's all the time we have for today, but if you have any other questions, please do reach out to us via the organizers. Uh, we're very happy to answer. Um, and just to note, we'll be running a few more deep dive sessions on EE finance um, towards the end of the year. So hopefully many of you can join us. Um, so just thank you so much for listening and thanks so much to our speakers for your time. Thank you, everybody. Thank you. Bye. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you.